The rape of Belgium is a phrase given to the German mistreatment of civilians during the invasion and subsequent occupation of Belgium during World War I. The neutrality of Belgium had been guaranteed by the Treaty of London 1839, which had been signed by Prussia. However, the German Schlieffen Plan required that German armed forces pass through Belgium thus violating Belgium's neutrality in order to outflank the French army, concentrated in eastern France. The German Chancellor Theobald von bethmann hollweg dismissed the Treaty of 1839 as a «scrap of paper». Throughout the beginning of the war, the German army engaged in numerous atrocities against the civilian population of Belgium, including the destruction of civilian property, 6,000 Belgians were killed, and 17,700 died during expulsion, deportation, imprisonment, or death sentence by court. Another 3,000 Belgian civilians died due to electric fences the German army put up to prevent civilians from fleeing the country, and 120,000 became forced labourers, with half of that number deported to Germany. 25,000 homes and other buildings in 837 communities were destroyed in 1914 alone, and 1 1.5 million Belgians of the entire population fled from the invading German army. <laughs> War crimes In some places, particularly Liege, Anden and Leuven, but firstly Dinon, there is evidence that the violence against civilians was premeditated. However, in Dinon, the German army believed the inhabitants were as dangerous as the French soldiers themselves. German troops, afraid of Belgian guerrilla fighters, or Franks tirers literally, free shooters burned homes and executed civilians throughout eastern and central Belgium, including Arscot 156 dead, Anden 211 dead, Says, Tamans 383 dead, and Dinon 674 dead. The victims included men, women, and children. In the province of Brabant, nuns were ordered to strip under the pretext that they were spies or men in disguise. However, there is no evidence that nuns were violated. In and around Arscot, between August 19 and the recapture of the town by September 9, women were repeatedly victimized. Rape was nearly as ubiquitous as murder, arson, and looting, if never as visible. On August 25, 1914, the German army ravaged the city of Leuven, deliberately burning the university's library of 300,000 medieval books and manuscripts with gasoline, killing 248 residents, and expelling the entire population of 10,000. However, contrary to what many believe and write, it was not the books of the old University of Leuven which disappeared in smoke. Indeed, in 1797, the manuscripts and most valuable works of this university were transported to the National Library in Paris, and much of the old library was transferred to the Central School of Brussels, the official and legal successor of the old University of Leuven. The library of the Central School of Brussels had about 80,000 volumes, which then came to enrich the Library of Brussels, and then the future Royal Library of Belgium where they are still. Civilian homes were set on fire and citizens often shot where they stood. Over 2,000 buildings were destroyed and large quantities of strategic materials, foodstuffs, and modern industrial equipment were looted and transferred to Germany in 1914 alone. These actions brought worldwide condemnation. 
There were also several friendly fire incidents between groups of German soldiers during the confusion. Overall, the Germans were responsible for the deaths of 23,700 Belgian civilians, 6,000 Belgians killed, 17,700 died during expulsion, deportation, in prison, or sentenced to death by court, and caused further non fatalities of 10,400 permanent and 22,700 temporary invalids, with 18,296 children becoming war orphans. Military losses were 26,338 killed, died from injuries or accidents, 14,029 died from disease, or went missing. Industrial dismantlement As raw material usually imported from abroad dried up, more firms laid off workers. Unemployment became a major problem and increased reliance on charity distributed by civil institutions and organizations. As many as 650,000 people were unemployed between 1915 and 1918, the German authorities used the unemployment crisis to loot industrial machinery from Belgian factories, which was either sent to Germany intact or melted down. The German policies enacted by the Imperial German General Government of Belgium would later create major problems for Belgian economic recovery after the end of the war. The Germans destroyed the Belgian economy so thoroughly by dismantling industries and transporting the equipment and machinery to Germany that it never regained its pre war level. Topic: Wartime propaganda. Agreeing with the analysis of historian Susan Kingsley Kent, historian Nicoletta Gullis writes that the invasion of Belgium, with its very real suffering, was nevertheless represented in a highly stylized way that dwelt on perverse sexual acts, lurid mutilations, and graphic accounts of child abuse of often dubious veracity." In Britain, many patriotic publicists propagated these stories on their own. For example, popular writer William Le Quer described the German army as one vast gang of Jack the Rippers, and described in graphic detail events such as a governess hanged naked and mutilated, the bayoneting of a small baby, or the screams of dying women, raped and horribly mutilated by German soldiers, accusing them of cutting off the hands, feet, or breasts of their victims, Gullis argues that, "...British propagandists were eager to move as quickly as possible from an explanation of the war that focused on the murder of an Austrian archduke and his wife by Serbian nationalists to the morally unambiguous question of the invasion of neutral Belgium." In support of her thesis, she quotes from two letters of Lord Bryce. In the first letter Bryce writes, "...there must be something fatally wrong with our so-called civilization for this sir B. Ian cause so frightful a calamity has descended on all Europe." In a subsequent letter Bryce writes, the one thing we have to comfort us in this war is that we are all absolutely convinced of the justice of the cause, and of our duty, once Belgium had been invaded, to take up the sword." Although the infamous German phrase, "'Scrap of Paper' Referring to the 1839 Treaty of London galvanised a large segment of British intellectuals in support of the war, in more proletarian circles this imagery had less impact. For example, Labour politician Ramsay MacDonald upon hearing about it, declared that 
Never did we arm our people and ask them to give up their lives for a less good cause than this. British Army recruiters reported problems in explaining the origins of the war in legalistic terms. As the German advance in Belgium progressed, British newspapers started to publish stories on German atrocities. The British press, quality, and tabloid alike, showed less interest in the endless inventory of stolen property and requisitioned goods that constituted the bulk of the official Belgian reports. Instead, accounts of rape and bizarre mutilations flooded the British press. The intellectual discourse on the "'scrap of paper' was then mixed with the more graphic imagery depicting Belgium as a brutalised woman, exemplified by the cartoons of Louis Raymakers, whose works were widely syndicated in the US. Part of the press, such as the editor of The Times and Edward Tyers Cook, expressed concerns that haphazard stories, a few of which were proven as outright fabrications, would weaken the powerful imagery, and asked for a more structured approach. The German and American press questioned the veracity of many stories, and the fact that the British Press Bureau did not censor the stories put the British government in a delicate position. The Bryce Committee was eventually appointed in December 1914 to investigate. Bryce was considered highly suitable to lead the effort because of his pre-war pro-German attitudes and his good reputation in the United States, where he had served as Britain's ambassador, as well as his legal expertise. The Commission's investigative efforts were, however, limited to previously recorded testimonies. Gullis argues that the Commission was in essence called upon to conduct a mock inquiry that would substitute the good name of Lord Bryce for the thousands of missing names of the anonymous victims whose stories appeared in the pages of the report." The Commission published its report in May 1915. Charles Masterman, the director of the British War Propaganda Bureau, wrote to Bryce. Your report has swept America. As you probably know even the most skeptical declare themselves converted, just because it is signed by you." Translated in ten languages by June, the report was the basis for much subsequent wartime propaganda and was used as a sourcebook for many other publications, ensuring that the atrocities became a leitmotif of the war's propaganda up to the final, Hang the Kaiser. Campaign, for example, in 1917 Arnold J. Toynbee published The German Terror in Belgium, which emphasized the most graphic accounts of authentic German sexual depravity, such as, In the marketplace of Gemblu, a Belgian dispatch rider saw the body of a woman pinned to the door of a house by a sword driven through her chest. The body was naked and the breasts had been cut off. Much of the wartime publishing in Britain was in fact aimed at attracting American support. A 1929 article in The Nation asserted, In 1916, the Allies were putting forth every possible atrocity story to win neutral sympathy and American support. We were fed every day. Stories of Belgian children whose hands were cut off, the Canadian soldier who was crucified to a barn door, the nurses whose breasts were cut off, the German habit of distilling glycerine and fat from their dead in order to obtain lubricants, and all the rest. The fourth Liberty Bond drive of 1918 employed a Remember Belgium poster depicting the silhouette of a young Belgian girl being dragged by a German soldier on the background of a burning village, historian Kimberly Jensen interprets this imagery as, "...they are alone in the night, and rape seems imminent." 
The poster demonstrates that leaders drew on the American public's knowledge of and assumptions about the use of rape in the German invasion of Belgium. In his book Roosevelt and Hitler, Robert E. Hertzstein stated that, "...the Germans could not seem to find a way to counteract powerful British propaganda about the rape of Belgium and other alleged atrocities." About the legacy of the propaganda, Gullis commented that, one of the tragedies of the British effort to manufacture truth is the way authentic suffering was rendered suspect by fabricated tales." <laughs> Aftermath <laughs> Later analysis In the 1920s, the war crimes of August 1914 were often dismissed as British propaganda. In recent years numerous scholars have examined the original documents and concluded that large-scale atrocities did occur, while acknowledging that other stories were fabrications. There is a debate between those who believe the German army acted primarily out of paranoia, in retaliation for real or believed incidents involving resistance actions by Belgian civilians, and those including Lipkas who emphasize additional causes, suggesting an association with German actions in the Nazi era. According to Larry Zuckerman, the German occupation far exceeded the constraints international law imposed on an occupying power. A heavy-handed German military administration sought to regulate every detail of daily life, both on a personal level with travel restraints and collective punishment, and on the economic level by harnessing the Belgian industry to German advantage and by levying repeated massive indemnities on the Belgian provinces. Before the war Belgium produced 4.4% of world commerce, but the Germans destroyed the Belgian economy so thoroughly, by dismantling industries and transporting the equipment and machinery to Germany, that it never regained its pre-war level. More than 100,000 Belgian workers were forcibly deported to Germany to work in the war economy, and to northern France to build roads and other military infrastructure for the German army. <laughs> <laughs> Historical studies Recent in-depth historical studies of German acts in Belgium include The Rape of Belgium, The Untold Story of World War I by Larry Zuckerman Rehearsals, The German Army in Belgium, August 1914 by Jeff Lipkes German Atrocities 1914, A History of Denial by John Horn and Alan Kramer. Horn and Kramer describe some of the motivations for German tactics, chiefly, but not only, the collective fear of a people's war. The source of the collective fantasy of the People's War and of the harsh reprisals with which the German army up to its highest level responded are to be found in the memory of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870–1, when the German armies faced irregular Republican soldiers or Frank's tirers, and in the way in which the spectre of civilian involvement in warfare conjured up the worst fears of democratic and revolutionary disorder order for a conservative officer corps. The same authors identify a number of contributory factors Inexperience leading to lack of discipline amongst German soldiers Drunkenness Friendly fire incidents arising from panic Frequent collisions with Belgian and French rearguards leading to confusion Rage at the stubborn and at first successful defense of Liege during the Battle of Liege 
rage at Belgian resistance at all, not seen as a people entitled to defend themselves. Prevailing almost hatred of the Roman Catholic clergy in Belgium and France ambiguous or inadequate German field service regulations regarding civilians failure of German logistics later leading to uncontrolled looting topic <inaudible> legacy at a commemoration ceremony on the 6th of May 2001 in the Belgian town of Dinon attended by Belgium's defense minister Andre Flaho, World War II veterans, and the ambassadors of Germany, France and Britain, State Secretary of the German Ministry of Defense, Walter Kolbo, officially apologized for a massacre of 674 civilians that took place on 23 August 1914 in the aftermath of the Battle of Dinon, we have to recognize the injustices that were committed, and ask forgiveness. That is what I am doing with a deep conviction today. I apologize to you all for the injustice the Germans committed in this town. Mr. Kolbo placed a wreath and bowed before a monument to the victims bearing the inscription, To the 674 Dinantize Martyrs, Innocent Victims of German Barbarism. See also Belgian Congo, Freikorps in the Baltic Hero and Namaqua Genocide (1904–1907), an earlier atrocity in German Southwest Africa. Leipzig War Crimes Trials. Het Belgisch Dagblad.